Welcome, everyone. My name is Dr. Laura Cohen, and I'm the executive director of the Harriet and Kenneth Kufferberg Holocaust Center at Queensborough Community College at the City University of New York in Bayside, Queens. Our mission is to use the lessons of the Holocaust to educate current and future generations about the ramifications of prejudice, racism, and stereotyping. Today's talk is entitled Building and Sustaining Indigenous Cultural Institutions of Today and features Jeremy Dennis, a photographer and founder of Moz House, who will talk about the role of this communal art space based on the Shinnecock Indian Reservation in Southampton, New York. The Kupferberg Holocaust Center in Bayside, New York is situated on the traditional land of the Mantinecock people who continue to live here today. We offer gratitude and respect to all of the indigenous people of Turtle Island, past, present, and future, including the Lenape and Shinnecock peoples. What I just read is what we call a land acknowledgement. This is a statement recognizing that the land we all occupy in the course of our daily lives, including our schools, jobs, parks, and homes, as well as the names of towns and roads, was first inhabited by another group of people who were forcibly, dispelled, forcibly expelled and murdered. Today, we identify those crimes for what they are, mass atrocities and genocide. These horrors continue to have devastating political, social, psychological, economic, and environmental impacts upon and within Native American and indigenous communities. Today's program is a collaboration between the Kupferberg Holocaust Center and the Museum and Gallery Studies Program in the Art and Design Department at Queensborough Community College. And it builds upon the KHC's longstanding tradition of connecting core themes within both Holocaust and human rights education of erasure and tragedy, of visibility and resilience, with how they are expressed and taught within and at museums and education centers. Today's program is co-sponsored by the Museum Studies MA program at the CUNY School of Professional Studies, the Ray Walpole Institute for the Study of the Holocaust, Genocide and Crimes Against Humanity at Western Washington University, the Holocaust and Human Rights Center in White Plains, the Center for the Study of Genocide and Human Rights at Rutgers University, the Institute for Human Rights at the University of Alabama in Birmingham, and the Genocide Studies Program at Yale University. Finally, after the presentation, please be sure to submit your questions via the Q&A feature on your screen. And now to kick things off, please join me in welcoming my dear colleague, Kat Griefen, Program Coordinator and Faculty Member in the Gallery and Museum Studies Program at Queensborough Community College, and a faculty member within CUNY School of Professional Studies. Kat, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Laura, for the warm welcome and introduction. And also thank you to Associate Director uh, Marissa Hollywood for your work on this program as well. And to the Art and Design Department, in particular, um, our chair, Kathleen Wentrack, for the support of this program. As Laura said, I'm the faculty member and program coordinator for the Gallery Museum Studies Program at Queensborough Community College. Our program is the only associate's degree in the discipline offered in CUNY, making it a uniquely affordable entry point into the museum field in our region. So I welcome questions about our program, so please feel free to reach out. Uh, hello to students on that note, hello to student, students present today and all the community members as well, so welcome. Um, this program is part of the ongoing Human Rights and Museum series, which in part comes out of a living land acknowledgement resulting from the Native American Survivance Project at the Kufferberg Holocaust Center, um, which was led by myself initially and Danielle Means, who took the form, and this took the form of a colloquium, exhibition, and publication starting in 2018. For this reason, indigenous voices and viewpoints are centered in many of the series events, um, including today's program. And we plan today's program in this contemporary moment when museum professionals and cultural workers are questioning the structures and founding principles of older museums and cultural institutions, especially those that came out of earlier colonial contexts and collecting practices. Many of our prior programs over the last three years in this series have addressed issues related to these historical institutions, such as repatriation. We considered in that case, both the context of reckoning with Nazi art theft, and then on the other hand, the complexities of museum work with NAG, uh, working with NAGPRA or the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act of 1990. But instead today, this program in the spirit of survivance looks to the present and to the future, considering the possibilities created by new cultural institutions that serve and speak to, with, and about indigenous communities now. In particular, we are honored to have the artist and founder of Ma's House, Jeremy Dennis, here to speak 
to you about recent about this recent cultural institution located nearby on the Shinnecock Indian Reservation in Southampton, New York. Ma's House, a project with Jeremy began in June in 2020, is an art space of Black, Indigenous, and people of color. The space is located in Dennis's former family home, which was built in the 1960s. For those of my students in Introduction to Gallery Museum Studies, it may be interesting to consider how this space is a kind of historic house museum, but operates much differently than other HHMs you have been learning about in class. The house holds a shared art studio and a communal library and hosts an array of history and art-based programs for tribal members and the broader local community. While history plays a role here, this is a space for living artists and vibrant contemporary communities to learn, create, and connect. Uh, before more formally introducing Jeremy momentarily, I'm also pleased to share that the current artist in residence at Ma's House is Bronx-based artist and educator Dennis Redmoon Darkeem, who was also featured in the KHC's 2020 Survivance Exhibition. Now, I'm very pleased to introduce Jeremy, who will speak about the creation of Ma's House and its work building and sustaining this vibrant cultural institution. Um, just to give you a little of his background, Jeremy Dennis is a photographer and an enrolled tribal member of the Shinnecock Indian Nation in Southampton, New York. In his work, he explores indigenous culture, uh, indigenous identity, culture, and assimilation. He has received numerous awards to support his work, including the Creative Bursar Award from Getty Images, as well as residencies at Yaddo, Birdcliff Artist Colony, Watermel Center, uh, and Vermont Studio C Center, only to name a few. He is at solo exhibitions at the Paris Art Museum, Stony Brook University, Suffolk County Historical Society, and a number of other venues. He has an MFA from Pennsylvania State University and a BA in studio art from Stony Brook University. Um, he lives and works in Southampton, New York, where he established Ma's House. And I also am very happy to invite you all to get to see his uh, own incredible photographic practice at a, a solo show opening at Acon Contemporary in New York City on November 2nd. We will share some links to some of these uh, materials in the chat um, for, you to, um, for you to continue to learn and see more. Jeremy, welcome. We are very honored to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us um, for a your second program in this series. Um, we are excited to talk to you about Ma's House. Oh, well, thank you, uh, Kat, for that wonderful introduction. And I'm so grateful to be here, um, spending time and uh, space with all of you. Um, I think what I'm gonna do first is uh, share my screen. And I have a um, series of uh, slides, images I want to share, um, speaking about the theme of today, um, creating new um, art institutions, new art spaces, um, how they're uh, being in, led by Indigenous people, um, especially focusing on Shinnecock and Ma's house. So I'm so grateful to be here. Um, on the left, we have, of course, the uh, promo for the event. But on the right, we have an image of the front facade of Ma's house back in about um, August 2021. So that is uh, myself, um, one of our al alumni of our program, Bo B Brewery, and uh, Pam uh, Pamela Council, who some of you might have um, recognized her famous work um, she had in Times Square with a bunch of uh, fingernails um, on top of the uh, surface of the temporary installation. And so I also want to start with a um, acknowledgement of the land. Um, this is Long Island, New York, of course, from um, Brooklyn to Montauk. And this is uh, so important because so much of the work that all of us do depends on the land depends on acknowledging um, where the land came from, um, who once lived there, who continues to um, live and exist, but perhaps removed from that land. And so this is actually a illustration done by David Bun Martin, of course, in 1992. And I only added a golden star where our current day, um, I like to describe it as a sliver of our territory here on Long Island. And so I didn't label the towns as they're known today, but we once had land uh, known as Shinnecock from East Quag on the western border to uh, Sag Harbor and Bridgehampton on the eastern border. And of course, there were no walls, <laughs> there were no hard barriers. This just kind of represents uh, place names and communities. And so uh, again, going with mapping, 
This is a screenshot from Google Maps, the uh, satellite imagery. And this is our uh, territory. Um, instead of Quag to Sag Harbor, we have about 800 square acres of land. It's only one mile north to south. Um, just a little bit of background. There's about 600 tribal members, more or less, who live here, who call themselves Shinnecock. And around the world, however, there's more than 1,800 of us who are enrolled, um, left home due to um, lack of space for new housing, left home for work, family, um, opportunity. And so um, one thing I always think about when I see this peninsula that we call home um, is what my grandmother uh, always said. Um, we're still here thanks to the water. Um, uh, fortunately, there was just nowhere left for us to be pushed back to. And so this relates to our uh, forced removal when the Long Island uh, Railroad came through. And so um, we have always been known as the uh, people of the Stony Shore. Um, Shinnecock is an Algonquin word that translates um, into that meaning. And so um, our original uh, inhabitants, our place that we truly call home is called Good Ground, um, also known as Hampton Bays, um, the Shinnecock Canal, um, current day Canoe Place Inn. So if you're into Google Maps, you can <laughs> pinpoint exactly. But um, ever since then, we designed this tribal seal and this flag to represent our nationhood, um, our government to government relationship with the United States. And so it's just so jam packed with imagery. Um, the thing that I really love about it is the yellow background. And so if you're familiar with the Native American medicine wheel, there's black, white, red, and yellow representing either the four um, seasons or the four directions. The yellow typically represents the east, and that's because of the sun rising. And there's just so much symbolism within that. The idea of a new hope, um, a new day, um, positivity, uh, starting fresh and moving forward in um, just a couple of different adjectives. And so I mentioned uh, federal recognition. Um, this is something that uh, tribal nations aspire to, um, for better or worse. It's essentially the United States acknowledging um, uh, unique Native American communities as um, having lineage and connection to the land um, even before European arrival. And so when we uh, received that title in 2010 as the Shinnecock Nation, we joined over 570 other um, current day um, nations. And so, like I mentioned before, each of us are essentially a little country within a country. Um, and even that, <laughs> like most people don't uh, acknowledge that fact. And so um, we end up um, sometimes being um, pushed to the margins of maps. Sometimes we're not even included. This map, for example, is so dense. But I sometimes laugh because Shinnecock is also <laughs> not listed here. Um, we do have our neighbors in Montauk, however. And so, um, so much of what we're known for is our jewelry, our powwow. These are just a couple of different examples, um, continuing from the past all the way into the present. Uh, this is one of our most important maps. Um, this isn't made by a Shinnecock person. It's actually made, I believe, by Southampton Town. But as you can see, no matter where you look, it either says Shinnecock, it says Indian Line, it says Indian Reserve. There's so much, uh, so much evidence of this land, um, which is now called the Shinnecock Hills, as being in our ownership, in our stewardship. And so this is something that, um, unfortunately, in 1859 was um, just outright stripped from us without compensation, without community agreement. And so one thing that's missing that exists today is the Long Island Railroad. And so it essentially goes along this northern road that you see. Um, 27 East today. And when that came through, um, the Hamptons essentially became what it um, ha has always been known for today, just a resort for the wealthy. And so we were unfortunately um, in the way, in the eyes of those who were developing it, and transforming it. And we now exist in this uh, green rectangle and we still fight for that land just um, a minute uh, away from us. And so this is a landscape photo that I took um, at a place called The Point. This is on Shinnecock, um, the southern tip of Shinnecock. And as you can see, it's just a beautiful, almost like a nature reserve. Um, 
it, it's almost as if um, no one has ever um, destroyed or desecrated or built upon this land. And that's essentially uh, still true. And yet, as you look into the distance, if you have a large screen, it's probably easier. <laughs> but um, you see all the mansions that are built right upon the water. And so my um, godfather, Keith, whenever we walk down to the water's edge here on Shinnecock, um, we, we always uh, say that we have to look at their mansions and then they across the water get to look at our be uh, beautiful reserve. <laughs> and so um, if you've ever been to our powwow, the oldest art form is something called wampum beadwork or wampum jewelry. And so for thousands of years, this material on the left, which is only found in the Northeast, has been rendered into these very delicate shell beads on the right. And even today, an authentic uh, wampum bead can sometimes um, uh, cost uh, $3 for a single purple and $1 for a single white. And over time, unfortunately, these were um, discarded by people who inherited this material and thought it was um, just something that didn't really have a lot of value. But um, it does take dozens and dozens of tries to even create something at this size. Uh, this is the Haudenosaunee or Iroquois Confederacy belt in upstate New York. And this represents, um, as you can see, it's not just jewelry, it's not currency. It represents um, storytelling. It represents um, unification and symbolism. Um, and so uh, this is the most famous example of wampum jewelry being used. But... Um, most people don't realize that in order for the Iroquois to get this, they had to come down to the coast and uh, engage with us. <laughs> so everything's always connected. I always remind people. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, here at Shinnecock, we're probably most known for our annual powwow. This is a photo I took up on the stage uh, around the bonfire. And this is the powwow in the off season. And so each um, annual uh, Labor Day weekend, um, this year it was September 1st to the 4th, the event, which is a gathering of nations, it's open to the public, attracts over 40,000 people over those four days. And as you can see, there's um, ticket booths, a lot of the ticket revenue goes towards our tribal jobs, our um, filling in potholes, things like that. And so this is the main fundraiser all year <laughs> um, for the tribe. And so I invite you to come and join us for next year. Um, I believe it will be our 83rd in a row. And so powwow is just such a important uh, time of the year. Um, for those who don't know, um, indigenous people here in uh, uh, North America, uh, Canada and beyond have experienced uh, colonization in the form of, um, uh, first it was um, forced assimilation, um, it was also genocide. It was um, uh, uh, military tactics of erasure and destruction. And so this was happening generation to gener generation. And so over time, many of our cultural practices were essentially erased, uh, stripped from us. Otherwise, violence would be um, put upon us. And so finally, in the last couple of generations, the last couple of decades, we're finally able to um, uh, practice who we are again, a simple idea of doing what our ancestors have been doing for thousands of years without being prosecuted or threatened with violence. And so this is um, in the center, Shanae Bullock, who's also a cultural uh, practitioner. Um, again, I'm not going to go too much into my personal <laughs> photography for today, but as a photographer and as an artist, I always think back to this image. Uh, this is the oldest ever a group photo of Shinnecock people ever created in 1884. And so it's the first, and yet the caption reads, this is the um, last of the Shinnecock Indians, uh, LI or Long Island, New York, uh, 1884. And so um, it's really um, just, I don't know what the word is to describe the idea of, um, we have to go out and photograph Native Americans in order to prove that they're disappearing. It's the uh, vicious circle in terms of this vanishing race narrative that continues to exist today. And so even though there's 600 of us on territory, um, people see us in person and even to our face say that we're not native enough, um, we no longer exist, 
um, people just don't acknowledge us. And so when I think of photography as a tool for good, I also think of it as a tool of um, destruction and colonization. And so all of this context um, is the background to Ma's house. Um, Ma's house uh, essentially is a family home that was inherited uh, by my family in 1960s. Um, it was built in the 1960s. And I actually grew up in the house in the uh, 1990s when I was born. <laughs> so I grew up in this house um, for about 13 years. Unfortunately, it was in such disrepair from the utilities not working to holes in walls to uh, just everything kind of breaking down over time. And so um, one of the reasons for that that most people don't realize is if you um, live on an Indian reservation, you don't have access to the same mortgages, to the same loans in order to build anything at all. And so even if you do somehow get the funds to build, um, you also can't get um, house insurance. So if something breaks down, that's um, directly out of your pocket. And often people really can't afford to do that. And so we have a Indian reservation in the Hamptons um, here on Shinnecock, um, according to previous censuses. Um, uh, the income for an individual can be anywhere between 8,000 to 10,000, whereas in Southampton, um, that number is um, uh, 10 times or more, depending on <laughs> whose who's, uh, house you're looking at. And so this is um, additional context into kind of the environment in which Ma's house exists. Um, we live in a marginalized community. Um, we've had issues with representation and economic disparities. And so just a little bit of background for Ma's house as well. We um, have a, a history of taking materials um, dating back to 1845 from a um, Grace Episcopal Church in Riverhead and using those same materials um, to build the house that we um, operate in today. And so on the left, you can actually see my grandfather taking apart <laughs> the, um, the old building with the cross in the top right of that um, above the image. And then that, that's the whole building on the bottom. And when we were doing renovation for Ma's house, you can still still see those uh, diagonal boards. And I don't have a photo of it, but um, my grandfather was self-taught and he didn't have a truck. <laughs> so he would use the family Volkswagen to somehow bring those huge boards all the way here to Shinnecock, which is uh, current day uh, 30 minutes. And so on the right, we have another beautiful family photo. That's my mother, Denise, on the horse, and her five siblings, along with uh, Ma, my grandmother, um, Loretta is her birth name, and Peter, my grandfather. And back before we had our major uh, powwow in the 1970s, um, what would happen is each family would actually host their own cultural <laughs> um, festivities in their front, uh, front yard, and that's true for Ma's house as well. And so in the 1970s, there was um, pony rides, there were archery ranges, there was a mini powwow stage for the siblings to dance upon. And slowly over time, we dedicated a huge uh, part of our reservation just to the annual um, celebration of powwow. And so everyone always asks, um, who is Ma? Is Ma my mom? Um, Ma is actually Loretta Silva, also known as Princess Silva Arrow. Um, she um, passed away, unfortunately, when I was only eight years old in 1998. And so much of what I learned about Ma uh, comes from my mom's uh, memory. Um, she's also the family historian. So it's almost as if um, <laughs> ancestors from long ago are still living because of my mom's incredible memory. And so this is another group photo of myself with a blue ball, uh, my sister on the left, my two cousins and Ma, uh, just a little bit cropped out. And so when Ma was um, nearly at the end of her life, um, she told my mom what should happen to the house. And she said that if nothing else, it should become a museum to family history and to Shinnecock history. And that's what we've been trying to do and more. And so going to the modern day Ma's house and what it is, it's a, a communal space here on the Shinnecock reservation. It's actually the only um, native-led um, artist residency 
um, on an Indian reservation as well. So we have that unique fact. And so going back to June 2020, when the pandemic was really peaking, we ended up uh, deciding as a family to try to save this 1960 home from falling in on itself. And so as you can see in this left image, there's actually a direct hole next to the chimney going from the inside to the outside. And that has always just been there. It's just been boarded up with uh, foam boards, um, some spray foam, um, other materials that were improvised. And living next to the ocean with all the salt water, all the humidity, this is pretty much a formula for um, <laughs> a house rotting away. And so when we started the GoFundMe in June 2020, we thought we would get a couple hundred, a couple thousand, but it actually amassed enough for us to completely um, transform the house into something livable. And because of that generosity, we really didn't think um, I should just be the sole person living in this house. Um, we should dedicate it to the generosity that made this renovation possible. So that was one of the um, reasons for turning Ma's house into what it is. Um, the other is the um, racial uh, re um, reckoning that we witnessed as a nation. And so we started Ma's house in June 2020, and we saw the uh, devastating news of the George Floyd uh, murder in May 2020. And so this was also the peak of BLM at the same time as the pandemic was happening. And really, um, the response by many uh, people of color is uh, social justice, um, healing within communities of color, telling the truth, and allocating sort of resources to um, organizations led by people of color in order to educate, empathize, and prevent um, this violence. And so we ended up um, not only looking at that police brutality, but also um, with the pandemic, those who had to continue working with these life-threatening conditions, those who had to continue being frontline workers, um, they were also largely people of color. And of course, we, we know the situation with healthcare in our country. And so those were some of the motivations. Um, we also looked to our um, uh, neighbors. We think about um, ATNC, uh, SC. They're based in Cleveland, Ohio, and the Forge Project up in Hudson. Um, for whatever reason, I think we all are in the same mindset that there needs to be more um, art institutions led by people of color. And so um, I think the the um, the big question behind today's presentation is the theme of um, maybe the questions perhaps of why do we need new art spaces? Um, why are art spaces popping up um, that are now led by people of color? And what's the issue um, or what's wrong with current art institutions? And so ProPublica, um, an online a journal, they released this really um, I would say uh, right to the point article, it's titled America's Biggest Museums Fail to Return Native American Human Remains. And so um, I recommend you read through it. It's such a thorough and eye-opening um, <laughs> experience, but it essentially talks about the history of how museums ended up uh, amassing their collections, both um, from pulling from Native American graves and also just the wealth that comes from having this new land for essentially um, paying zero dollars for. And so um, pulling some of the screenshots from this article, um, I think that the essential of what I'm trying to uh, state is that so many um, institutions, whether it's art or just museums in general, are um, intertwined, rooted in colonization, um, those who have like 100 plus year existence and histories. And so, as I mentioned, um, these museums were usually an individual, a family who amassed wealth. They benefited from colonization, um, uh, in industrialization, uh, imperialism, and settle, uh, settler colonization. And so they used that wealth and the extraction and the enslavement of um, other people to build these structures, the, to build their um, houses, to build these museums. And essentially, um, as this went on, as a, um, a new reality for these uh, communities who are being extracted from, um, they essentially had to give away 
some of their cultural objects just to pay for simple things like water, food, and shelter. And so I want to um, just <laughs> briefly mention a couple of examples. Um, this is the um, uh, old parish art museum. This is uh, currently the Southampton Art Center. It's on Job's Lane here in Southampton. And one thing that most people don't realize is, um, as I mentioned before, the Shinnecock Hills is sacred to us. It's a landscape that's just dotted with our ancestors' um, burial grounds. And when the Long Island Railroad came through and that land was stripped from us, one of the lawyers from that for that whole railroad project was actually Samuel uh, Parrish, who founded the Parrish Art Museum. And so he was actually so wealthy, <laughs> he and his family were so wealthy, that he as an individual actually became mayor of Southampton Town. He actually had so much wealth as an individual that he paved the roads. Um, he had enough money to move entire mansions <laughs> wherever he wanted. And eventually, of course, when you have a lot of wealth, you invest in culture and the arts and show off that wealth to the public as a, a status symbol. And so um, this entire building exists because of the wealth um, taken from Shinnecock. So for those who don't know, um, this is the Hamptons, single acre without a house even, can be worth um, multi-million dollars uh, alone. Um, this is the South Old Indian Museum. Um, I apologize for the strange um, formatting, <laughs> but the uh, image on the left is partially covered. That's the entrance of the uh, South Old Indian Museum, and it's partially covered by one of our ancestors' um, um, clay bowls. And so this is another institution that we constantly have to be at odds with. It kind of represents East End's um, basically Native American um, cultural institutions is the only one that really is operating um, within our area. It's about an hour away. And yet the entire collection is um, amateur archaeologists. It's a lot of um, things happen had been uh, taken from graves and glued together in the case of this urn. And so we um, fight every day just to have people see the truth about who we are. Um, we look at institutions like this and say, like, why do they still exist? Why do they keep getting funded? Why do people keep going to them? And what are the alternatives? Um, one other reason, going back to Shinnecock territory itself, that we have Ma's house um, and it, it it exists today is the fact that our um, beautiful Shinnecock Museum, um, which I believe was founded around um, 2013 or earlier, um, it has unfortunately been um, out of operation for several years at this point. And so the object collection is beautiful. It has uh, many family photos, many donated objects, but just uh, due to many different reasons, this has unfortunately been uh, closed to the public. And so we started Ma's House out of the need to have a cultural center, to have a place where artists can not only be appreciated, um, have a space to work and have feedback, have community. Um, this would be a beautiful space to continue that. And in fact, there's so many articles online that um, provide evidence on how small institutions like Ma's House can be a benefit to Shinnecock Museum and other local institutions. And so going back to Ma's house, um, <laughs> I, I described many different museums and uh, we ended up not using that term museum as part of Ma's house. For example, we didn't call it the Ma's house museum. Um, just because of that simple association, um, the idea that things are gonna be behind glass, um, things shouldn't be interacted with. Um, things kind of go to museums to um, die <laughs> in some in some people's um, voices. Um, sometimes objects that are supposed to be used and appreciated to every day end up in vaults, end up in drawers, um, things that never see the light for months or years. And so with Ma's House, we wanted to identify ourselves as a living space led by um, native uh, artists. And so this is the before and after of the uh, front of the house. This is actually the original footprint of the house itself. It was a single story, uh, one room house back in the 1960s. 
And um, I was going to point it out. You can't see the diagonal boards in this image, but up above, you can see the old growth uh, timber from the uh, old church. And so the renovation continues today, <laughs> living in the Hamptons. Um, everything is not only inflated um, in terms of price nationwide, but everything was already kind of crazy here in the Hamptons alone. And so we're continuing to fundraise, we're continuing to renovate, uh, replace rotted out materials and so on. And so after uh, a little bit over a year from June 2020 into uh, July 2021, we finally made it livable. <laughs> we tried. We finally had Ma's house with running water, a heating system, all these basic things that can sometimes be taken for granted. And so we immediately opened the floor for an artist residency. And this is our first ever um, resident artist, Yan Yan Huang. And so it's really incredible because um, <laughs> I have to admit we still had cobwebs, we still had holes in walls, we still had um, so much to do, and yet there was just such an enthusiasm by artists of color to apply, um, participate, volunteer, visit, and so on. And so one of the things that we emphasize is that you don't have to create, you can just come to Ma's house and rest, you can come, come here and just feel appreciated, um, you can just come here and read a book. And yet if you look at the slide, um, this was all done um, in less than a month's time during Yan Yan's uh, residency. And so this is a, another image of a different um, resident artist. This is uh, Ali Mitchell, who's a, a screenwriter. And so what we do at Ma's house is we invite and support um, artists of all mediums, from critics to writers, um, performers, uh, visual artists, and so on. And so one of the um, successes, I would say, from our residency program is the fact that many artists say this is the first ever residency that they've ever applied to, the first ever that they felt excited for, the first they felt like they belonged, and the first, some in some cases, that they ever were accepted. And so just that simple idea of being an artist of color or being a person of color and feeling like your voice matters, feeling like what you have to contribute matters. Unfortunately, in other art institutions, unless um, you have commercial success, unless your work already has a history of having value in an auction, um, sometimes voices can easily get uh, excluded from what is considered art and what we should hang on our walls. And so that was one of the big <laughs> uh, choices that we made as part of Ma's house in our gallery. The idea that not everything has to be for sale, not everything has to sell in order to be successful. And in fact, as an artist myself, that's a lot of um, what I end up doing, um, I work a lot with museums. I don't <laughs> ever really work with commercial galleries just because my work doesn't really sell. But because I'm working in social justice, just like many of our artists, um, shouldn't they also have a space to exist? And so the previous two slides, this is um, work by an artist named Pamela uh, Allen. And she uh, created this mandala and also stated that same thing that she had nowhere else to experiment and try this amazing project. And finally, with uh, Ma's house, we were able to uh, provide that space. Um, we also have weekly workshops ranging from um, any medium you can imagine. <laughs> uh, we also have weekly um, history classes. And it's all just about the idea of bringing people together. Um, this is uh, Shane Weeks, who's leading a history class and many uh, tribal members who are in the room with, him, with us. Um, this is also the um, before and after of the residency room. So all year long, we dedicate this um, bedroom as part of Ma's house to artists of color to come and stay for two weeks, to be inspired by Shinnecock. The library in this room has uh, over two dozen books based on Long Island's native history. And we do ask that each artist um, maybe be inspired by Shinnecock land, history, current issues, and what that ends up doing is not only creating a connection between those of us who are here, but also when they go back home and present their portfolios, they now um, present and honor Shinnecock. And we no longer become this one mile north to south little dot in the map. We've become this much larger um, uh, topic, this much larger contribution. 
uh, culturally. And so this is a uh, photo <laughs> that actually one of our participants took. They took a, a selfie at one of our free public uh, workshops. And so every week since last uh, June, my mother, uh, Denise Silva Dennis, has been doing these free public um, workshops on beading. So we've done um, bracelets, necklaces, belts, uh, bandolier bags, and more. And all the materials are provided. And um, a lot of this is thanks to donors, especially um, the Creatives Rebuild New York opportunity that we are uh, currently part of. And so, as I mentioned before, um, this whole idea of Moss House never <laughs> really occurred to us before um, maybe May of 2020. The idea of all of this gathering, all these new connections, all the possibility. And so I think that the biggest um, accomplishment is the bridging of different communities. And so it's so true here in Suffolk County, the idea that um, communities are so segregated. You can actually look at Google Maps and point at those who have wealth, those who have a certain cultural identity, those who are native, those who are black, those who are white and so on. And so this is something that as part of Ma's house, we have <laughs> a very modest space. We have very modest uh, means as a community. And yet we're able to lead and have this transformational uh, way of bringing people together. And so I didn't add the caption, but this is the uh, Queens Museum who came for a tour not too long ago, which is really amazing. And so um, going back to our gallery, um, this is actually my mother, Denise, on the right and my uh, Aunt Gloria on the left. And um, the amazing thing about this exhibit and this photo is the fact that my mother, who's just, of course, gen one generation before me, um, she actually went to school through the same process that I did. She went to studio art, she did the um, undergrad, she went to college and had a serious um, progression, but her mentors told her that she would never become anything um, because she's a woman, she would never become anything because she's a, a Native American doing painting. And so it was only um, last year that we finally gave her a solo show at Ma's house as part of our exhibit um, uh, list. And this was the first solo show that my mother had in uh, 40 years. So she's in her 60s now. And I think it's just that alone <laughs> is such a, a great feeling and accomplishment. And so every two weeks, we have a different opening reception. I invite you to jo uh, join our newsletter or follow us on social media for the next um, announcement. But as you can see, it's such a, a diverse group of people who show up, people who I always describe as um, allies who should probably <laughs> already know each other, but um, uh, for uh, better or worse, finally come together. And thanks to Ma's house, um, they end up connecting. And so this is my uh, partner. This is uh, Brianna Hernandez, who is our curator. Um, she's standing and doing a tour of our um, previous Thomas Indian School exhibit. And um, this is based on the boarding school that existed historically in upstate New York, where even some of our Shinnecock relatives went and experienced that um, idea of forced assimilation um, they went as Native Americans, and um, the motto of these boarding schools was um, to save the man, you have to kill the Indian. And so, um, as you can see, it was not a very uh, pleasant place just by the photos alone. And the amazing thing about the exhibit was that it was so informative, but it was also accompanied by um, current day photos by Seneca Nation artists. And so another um, accomplishment <laughs> as part of Ma's house is we were featured in Teen Vogue. Um, they're currently just doing online publications, but I always think it's so funny that um, it's uh, Teen Vogue. It's supposed to be like youth and fashion and um, like playfulness and social media. And yet they always do such um, groundbreaking and incredible stories about um, Indian country and Native Americans. And so we ended up being invited around uh, September 2021 to participate. And so not only did they highlight Ma's house, but they also interviewed and did portraits of uh, many Shinnecock teen teenagers as well. 
And so simply having a space for people to reach out to, to connect with and provide opportunity is so um, transformative. Um, this is also another amazing room in our house um, as part of Ma's house. I would say this is our most incredible asset. This is our uh, Ma's house communal library. And uh, last year, um, actually it was um, 2021, the uh, Sag Harbor Library, the John Germain Library, donated over uh, 400 books on Native American content. So it's regional, it's nonfiction, it's academic, poetry, and everything else. And so this is such an incredible volume of books. And yet, um, one thing that normally happens at libraries is they deaccession books that um, don't have value to their immediate community. And so it was the case where the community didn't have enough room in their uh, library to have these books and have them available. And yet we as Ma's House, um, <laughs> this is our most precious topic. This is what we look to present. And so this is another thing where you kind of need to have more than um, one center for culture, for libraries, for um, information. And that's another reason Ma's House exists. Um, because we're so small, we have been working with different institutions, other nonprofits, and art spaces and museums to have satellite um, exhibits. And so just recently, um, this past August to Oct uh, October, we worked with the Old Stone House in Brooklyn to create an exhibit that features not only our alumni of our program, our residency program, but it also featured an open call for artists of color throughout the nation to submit work, um, actually inspired by not only um, the Ma's House project, but um, my grandmother, Laura da Silva, <laughs> also known as Ma. And so these are just a couple of examples of um, how partnerships can benefit both institutions. It also just goes to the heart of um, what museums should be. They should represent the community. They should represent um, those who are living in the area and um, amplify voices. It shouldn't be spaces of exclusivity, um, spaces that are um, alien to those who um, kind of just want to go to their local museum and have that uh, example or that experience of feeling welcomed. And so these are just a couple of more examples. Um, see, there's these are some of the artists during the opening reception. And I was just astounded at how much interest there was in the submission process. Um, it is a, another small space, but we received over 80, 80 submissions, and we had to somehow narrow it down to just 11 artists, which was so difficult. Um, here at Ma's house, we also have um, exhibits, of course. Um, I invite you to come and visit us for our current one. It's up until November 25th, but this is a solo show by an artist named Suhei Guterres, um, Entre Mis Mundos, or Enter My World. And so it's a incredible show that features paintings and um, everything is also um, for sale and on, on our website if you're interested. Um, as part of our nonprofit work, um, uh, one thing that stood in the back of our mind was the idea of accessibility and inclusion. And really um, so many nonprofits say that's their biggest priority, but the physical barriers of entry into their institutions. Um, it's just a simple thing that needs to be resolved. Um, it needs to actually be <laughs> accessible to everyone. And so we have a lot of elders in our community, a lot of elders come to our programs. And so finally, um, just about two months ago, we had a ramp uh, for our accessibility and that was um, fundraised through our different programs. And so if you're interested in learning more about the Moz House Project, this is the URL. There's actually uh, two mini documentaries that are free online um, about the project as well, if you're interested in seeing that before visiting. And even though um, our nonprofit launched in uh, August 2021, we've had so many partnerships, we've had so many um, uh, support streams, and we continue to build new relationships. And I think this is all to say that there needs to just be more and more um, art institutions, art institutions led by people of color. There's such a um, mutual reciprocity. Um, everyone benefits when there's just more um, spaces to support 
those who are in need um, in the arts especially. And so to end, this is just going to be the last slide. It kind of gives you a sense of um, different offerings. Um, these are just different ways to get in contact. We also have a Moss House podcast that features all of our alumni. Um, we also are active on social media and Instagram. So I invite you to um, not only try to make it out, but also stay up to date on these different platforms and uh, share where you see um, others who might have an interest. So I think um, I'm going to stop sharing, but I appreciate you all listening and um, look forward to seeing if there's any comments or questions. And thank you again for your time. Jeremy, thank you. Thank you so much for this incredible presentation um, and taking us through a tour of the history of Moss House and your region. Um, and this time, for the, we don't even have to wait. The hands are raised immediately. So um, I see that Rebecca White has um, her hand raised. I think that um, the format that we're using for this program, she'll, you'll need to post into the Q&A, um, if I'm correct. Um, so Rebecca, if you could post your question in the Q&A, um, that would be great. And we're happy to pass that along to Jeremy. I see, Rebecca, that you're saying first, thank you for your time. So um, yeah, we appreciate you, Jeremy. While we wait for Rebecca's question or any other questions or comments, um, and again, I want to encourage my students to, to, to post, to, to share, to ask, to ask things, as well as all the community members who are here, um, I'll get us started with a question. Um, I loved what you said about this idea that Ma, um, your grandma, said that she wanted the house to be a museum to family history and Shinnecock history. If you had accomplished just that, it would have been it would be an enormous accomplishment. But in in you know in hearing about all the different activities and knowing about all the different activities that you're involved with, um, Ma's house is not only about history, it's very much a contemporary place a, 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 with expansive vision, and expansive programming. Um, how did you move and why did you move or add so much um, contemporary material, space for living artists, um, when you, you absolutely could have done the simple and important task uh, of, of honoring the, the family history and the community's history? Oh, absolutely. Thank you for that question, Kat. Um, I think it just came out of my personal interest as an artist. Yeah. I, um, of course, do digital photography, and it all comes from the process of taking history or taking things that have been written down, things that I think need to be highlighted and amplified, and creating images that uh, try to represent that important information. And so it does uh, fuse the past and the present. They're always intertwined. And that's something that I acknowledge in my work. It's also in the work of Ma's House. And so all the weekly workshops that we do, those are um, passed down generation to generation techniques. It's part of our traditional practice to do beadwork and have those different designs. And that continues today. Um, one section I didn't show of Ma's House is the um, <laughs> the specific, uh, specific books that we have in our library. I would say that's definitely in the realm of uh, what my grandmother envisioned, just the idea of having those accessible at all, some of these very hard to find books, is uh, part of accomplishing that. But I think the simple fact that when people think of Native Americans, they think of, um, unfortunately, sometimes a static group of people, people in the past, um, they think of black and white or sepia images, they don't really think of us as continuing to exist. And so just reinforcing that idea that we continue to have so much to offer, we have so much to contribute, um, not only culturally as what we do at part of Ma's house, but I think when people come together who are Native and non-Native and see what everyone's up to, it's just so um, eye-opening. Yeah, I love that you brought up the library too, because <clears throat> the Kufferberg Holocaust Center also began, well, began as a library, it began in the basement of the library on um, at Queensborough Community College, first out of that important um, task of, of speaking about history so that it's not forgotten. And so the fact that that, you know, there's, when we planned this program, we were thinking about um, while the, you know, the Coverbrook Holocaust Center has a, it's been around for a few decades, I still think of it as a younger organization in comparison to the 
so, you know, the museums, the other museums are referring to other institutions. So it's interesting to think what's important. And in, and in many, and I love that you spoke about how vital the resource is the library itself. I think we feel, we feel much the same way. Um, let's see, I, we have a question in the chat. Uh, Gerard what, uh, asks, what advice do you have for traditionally colonial institutions who'd like to feature indigenous art or artifacts in an authentic and respectful way? Oh, thank you, Jared, for that question. Um, it is always um, such a nuanced um, topic in terms of um, like outside institutions showing indigenous art and um, objects. Um, I think it always has to come from, um, <laughs> well, I'll give you an example because the uh, Killers of the Flower Moon just came out. That's a um, very famous film by Martin Scorsese. And it's a um, harrowing history of the Osage. And yet um, one of the uh, criticisms I had, even though it in incorporated indigenous language and indigenous actors in such a beautiful way, um, the original book that the movie is based on is actually through the lens of a non-native person. And in the um, 2013, the film is also being directed by a non-native person. And so I do wonder um, are institutions capable of releasing that <laughs> authorship and allowing um, Indigenous people to speak for ourselves um, to guide that whole process? And so um, it is a, a tricky balance because sometimes, um, like the community, sometimes those who attend museums, they um, associate with the staffers who put on the shows. And so um, I think there's this... Um, this disconnect between understanding that needs to happen. And so when I um, get reached out to by people out of the blue to do different um, exhibits, to have my work curated, um, it always it is always a question of like, how much do they know about Shinnecock? Um, how much will they know when they present it to the public when I'm not there? And um, really it's a lot of, um, <laughs> it's almost like boring work to do the research first in order to have the excitement work of celebrating culture and having that thorough understanding and so it is just something that is ongoing like i myself am still learning so much about shinnecock and so i think it is interesting when it is um always native led if possible so i hope that sort of answers <laughs> I think that's an excellent answer. And I'll refer back to another program that I think we may have a recording of, at least um, we have some materials on the Kupferberg Holocaust Center's website. It's Diane Freyer, um, who founded um, the Native American uh, Contemporary Arts Organization, Amarinda in New York, who's a filmmaker, um, who was, in addition to Daniel Means, who co-curated the Survivance Exhibition, um, it was Diane Freyer, who was our, our elder advisor. Um, and she's a wonderful filmmaker who's, you know, been creating work through her through her eyes for a long time as a filmmaker. So there are those filmmakers out there doing that um, work um, more and more um, in addition to, to some of the, the Hollywood uh, options that we have now <laughs> or have had for a while. Okay, we have um, a question from Karina Dykman. Um, how successful have attempts to return um, indigenous artifacts back to their respective tribes from institutions that rightfully possess them been? I will say, I know, Karina, you are very thoughtful. I know it's a wonderful student of mine. Um, and I'll just, and I'll, and I'll say, I know that she's thinking of that question in terms of what you spoke about, about the local museum that has grave goods that they have on display. So don't feel you need to answer that question for, for in, in the broad sense necessarily, but maybe for any activities that you may be aware of in your community. Oh, sure. And uh, thank you, Karina, for that question. I'm going to um, also put into the chat that ProPublica um, article. The um, unfortunate thing, just speaking um, uh, broadly, is the fact that um, so many amateur archaeologists worked and um, took from the ground and gave to these institutions. Sometimes they sold them for profit. Um, some, sometimes people refer to it as like the golden age of archaeology when you could really dig anywhere and do it in a way that no one else has really done it and prosper from that whole process. And so that has happened, of course, here on Long Island. We've been here as uh, Shinnecock people for over 10,000 years. And so really anywhere you dig, you're probably going to find um, some sort of a material culture. And so one of the um, things that that article um, presents as a really um, desperate situation is the fact that 
so many of those objects, like even if the museums have a willingness to part with them, they um, are something called uh, being culturally unidentifiable. So amateur archaeologists go in, they um, dig up something, they document um, nothing at all about what they did. And sometimes it's the like the son or the daughter of that person who inherits these objects. And um, they kind of have no information about where they came from as well. So they give them to a museum. And then the museum is informed that, the, um, that, that the, of course, is not a good practice anymore <laughs> to hold on to these um, burial offerings. And so when they try to return them to local tribes, there's just no information about um, who, who they re should return to. Um, where they were taken from. And so one of the um, crazy things here on, in Long Island is the fact that we are the closest um, federally recognized tribe in Southampton um, to New York City, for example. So it goes up to Hudson, and that's still the case. And so if there's any institution within that whole realm, it could be the Smithsonian, it could be the um, Natural Museum of Natural History, it could be the um, National Museum of the American Indian even, they sometimes reach out and say that we have these objects, we don't know where they came from, but they're extremely sensitive. And you really can't say with certainty um, that we should claim them more than any other tribe that exists in the area. It's such a, a difficult situation for everyone involved. And so what sometimes ends up happening here on Long Island at least, is there, there's a coalition of different tribal nations we all work together, and then we dedicate a new place, um, which is essentially a cemetery, a place where these remains can once again uh, rest in the ground. So it might it might not be the original place, but it's finally out of the hands of those who are um, poking and prodding needlessly, um, uh, basically human remains. And so that's something that we're um, always trying to fight against because um, within that article, there's just thousands of examples of institutions having these different objects. And um, for, for um, <laughs> that's just the uh, public side of it. So I'm not going to get too much into the rest of it. But um, because there is such a wealth of um, history here as it relates to Indigenous people, not all of these objects go to institutions. Sometimes there's human remains that stay in the family's homes or there's uh, collectors and all kinds of um, markets for this type of thing. And so it's really just scratching the surface in terms of uh, what's out there and what needs to be done uh, ethically and morally. Yeah, I think you make a good point that while we have uh, the NAGPRA, which I referenced in the introduction, it doesn't pertain, these laws from 1990s don't pertain to private collections. So yeah. there's all kinds of circumstances. Um, but I do think it's worth mentioning um, not necessarily as an accolade, but just as a piece of news item that we present this program during the week that the that the um, the American Museum of Natural History has has said for the first time, and I think very surprisingly, even to people who some staff people I know who have worked there, that they will not be um, exhibiting human remains in the future. Um, so whether um, this conversation about where also cultural materials that came from graves. Um, will be and whether they will be exhibited in the future. I feel like maybe there is some movement in that direction or some change and be interesting to see how that, what happens. Um, mm -hmm. I'll also refer folks to the two, we did two programs in this um, first part of the Survivance Program and then into this series on repatriation, one with Jackie Swift um, from who's a repatriation manager at Smithsonian um, and also with David Bun Martin um, in an earlier program who Jeremy mentioned, um, who's from, um, from your community um, and he was speaking to some of these circumstances. So there's, there's more materials, Karina and others who are interested within the KHC's prior programming that you can find on YouTube. Um, so our, our Q&A is still open. If other folks have uh, questions, um, we really welcome those. These have, We've had some really good questions already. Um, I see Christina is raising her hand. Christina, the format we're using is the, the typed Q&A uh, for this program. So if you could, um, we'd love to have your question. Uh, please go ahead and type that into the Q&A. You see that link at the bottom of your Zoom. Um, and um, maybe we'll talk about one or two other things while while Christina goes ahead and, and puts her, her question into the Q&A. Um, what else? You know, I think we, 
it may be more for a future, in addition to this conversation, to a future program, um, because we loved having you um, speak about your project, your photographic project on this site. Um, and we really are so happy to have you here talking about Ma's house today. But I wonder if for those folks from our art and design department, especially, you might share a little bit about your own photographic work um, and how you've been able to continue that work as you do the work of Ma's house. I think you're not the only one um, uh, who, you know, I think a lot of indigenous folks working in the cultural realm end up wearing many hats and and uh, sustaining their own their own work while also lifting up others. So if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit about what you do, um, that'd be wonderful. Oh, absolutely. And um, I didn't know that about um, David Ben Martin also participating because um, it's funny because he's also a visual artist and he used to have my um, job. So I'm also the acting Tribal Historic Preservation Officer for Shinnecock Nation. And really, it's just the um, process of communicating and preventing a future desecration of Native sites. And it's such an overwhelming job. So I, I understand why he transitioned to uh, Amarind. But it's, um, like I said, it's it spans 120 miles to our west, um, all the way to New York City. And you're just responding to Zooms and emails all day. So that's part of what I do in my background. The other is the on the site project that you mentioned. It's um, something I started in 2016, thanks to a, um, a major grant from a nonprofit called Running Strong. And it essentially looks um, at Long Island through a site specific uh, lens, looking at native history um, and presenting that information through landscape photography. So I've only, again, scratched the surface in that project but what I'm doing in about a week um, is exciting. I was offered a um, residency at the Andy Warhol um, residency in Montauk. So I'll be out there doing research, um, looking at archives and hopefully doing drone photography for the first time. And then I'm also hoping this fall and winter to work with different hotels and um, inns up the island in Nassau County to find space where I can just um, uh, research locally, um, spend the night, and go to different sites to do landscape photography. And really, it's just such a, a massive project. It's 120 miles wide, the island, it's 10,000 years of history, and it hopes to go into the future as well. So I think eventually I'm going to try to figure out how to <laughs> have assistance, how to have like an online submission so others can contribute as well. But it is a um, large endeavor. Jeremy. Yeah, Thank you so much for, for speaking to us about Ma's house and on the site and all of the things that you're involved in. We're, we're really grateful for your time and for everything you've shared today. Um, with that, I will go ahead and turn it back over to Dr. Laura Cohen um, to, to begin to close us out for today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kat. Thank you so much, Jeremy. I've, I've been sitting here wrapped and I there are so many things that I want to comment on. And I think the overriding thing is the amount of hope that comes through in your presentation. And that um, especially in, when I look at the field of Holocaust education, when I think about Holocaust memorials and museums, and so much of the conversation is about what happened in the past and bringing light to it and celebrating who people were and not just focusing on how they died. And here you are talking about how very much your community is alive and is everywhere and impacts all of the, the spaces and places that our American society is founded upon. And the fact that you continue to do this work and do it from a place of love and even in the space, of, and I, 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 you do it from a place of love despite all of the ways that it Make that the, the society is set up to not have you succeed. I was just thinking about how expensive it is, for example, and, and where you are, and just literally the fact that you continue to do this work. And I'm just really grateful that you share of your time and, and your passion with our community here. Um, being in conversation with you, being in conversation with other Indigenous artists and, and Native American artists has really been very transformative for me on a professional level and on a personal level, and has really changed how I think about this work and making connections. And you said it before so eloquently between the past and the present. And so um, 
Thank you. Thank you so much. And Kat, it's always, uh, I'm just always grateful to collaborate with you. And thank you to everyone who tuned in today. And on behalf of the Kupferberg Holocaust Center at Queensborough Community College and the Museum and Gallery Studies Program, we're really grateful to all of you. We hope you stay safe and be well. Thank you.